In 1936, the German Empire stood as the most powerful country in the world. Sure, the Germans had had a few issues in the 20s because, you know, giving the army dictatorial powers usually results in a very unpopular dictatorship, but now they stood as the world's only superpower, and it was all thanks to its economy. After the Welt Krieg, the Germans had been able to take control of every resource-rich colony the Entente had in Africa and Asia. And on top of that, they were also in charge of Middle Europa, an economic bloc comprised of every European nation that wasn't syndicalist or anywhere near the Balkans. Thanks to this, Germany was basically printing money, and they were spending it too. They'd built the world's second largest navy, they were spending a lot on welfare, they were subsidizing their colonies, they were investing a lot of money into the other members of Middle Europa. And while some may say that this amount of spending combined with the fact that Germany's economy was very, and I mean very, deregulated was a recipe for disaster, it was fine. Germany was the richest country in the world, and it also had the world's largest economy. They were too big to fail. Oh shit, the stock market crashed. While no one was really ready for Black Monday, the way the German government handled the crisis was awful. The imperial government believed that the only way they could mitigate the crisis was to stop spending money. So when the banks asked them for a bit of economic aid, the government said no. However, when the colonies asked for economic aid, the government was more than happy to send them all the money they needed. Similarly, when the Middle European agricultural crisis started, the government was very willing to give economic aid to Eastern Europe. But when the German companies asked for aid because because they were going bankrupt, the government let them collapse. As you can probably imagine, the German people were not very happy with the way the government was handling Black Monday, so a lot of them started turning towards syndicalism. While syndicalism had never really been popular in Germany due to the government's anti-syndicalist propaganda, every day more and more Germans started supporting it thanks to the imperial government's sheer incompetence during the Black Monday crisis, and thanks to the fact that syndicalism was the only real alternative to the current German government. Seeing that they now had millions of supporters, the German syndicalists started urging the people to protest against the imperial government, so millions of angry citizens started staging anti-government rallies where they demanded the resignation of the current government and elections to pick a new one. Obviously, the imperial government didn't like that, so they started trying to suppress these rallies, which led to the army fighting against the people, which quickly spiraled into a full-scale civil war. The German Civil War was a fairly quick affair. Support from the Third International mixed with the Imperial Army's lack of a will to fight led to the syndicalists coming out on top. But while they'd won the war, they now had a very big problem. The German people didn't like syndicalism. The Germans had only supported syndicalism because they hated the Kaiser more than the syndicalists. And now that the Kaiser was gone, the new revolutionary government was in a very awkward position where the people that helped them get into power now wanted them gone. But before anything drastic could happen, Ernst Thalmann, de facto leader of the the SMEPD had a revelation of sorts. If the German people didn't like syndicalism because it only gave the right to vote to the trade unions and rejected democracy, then why not slightly alter syndicalism so that the people could vote on which trade unions would be in charge of the country? While many said that what Thalman was suggesting was just the normal republican system, everyone agreed that it was better than being overthrown by the populace. So the Revolutionary Council began preparing the first German syndicalist elections. At first it seemed as if Thalman would win the elections, and quite comfortably too. But then something unexpected happened. Seemingly out of nowhere, a small man called Joseph Goebbels started running for presidency. And he wasn't just running for office, he was winning. While Thalman and the other syndicalists were trying to sell syndicalism to the masses, Goebbels was giving fiery speeches about Germany's glory and how it was Germany's destiny to become the world's most powerful nation and that only he could guide Germany towards that destiny. So when election day came, it didn't really surprise anyone that Goebbels and his party had won in a landslide. After being elected, Goebbels first act as head of the German Trade Union Congress was to disband the German Trade Union Congress. According to him, the current syndicalist system was bloated and useless, so he replaced it with his own brand of syndicalism, national syndicalism. This new and improved syndicalism gave the government full control of the economy and it gave the president full control over the government. In simpler terms, it gave Goebbels complete and total control over Germany. After making himself supreme ruler for life, Goebbels decided that it was time to fix the economy and fix the people. While fixing the economy was a fairly simple affair since all he really had to do was give the industrialists and the technocrats full control of the economy, fixing the people would be slightly harder. Goebbels knew that not everyone would agree with his genius system, so instead of wasting precious time and resources purging or censoring anyone that disagreed with him, Goebbels simply let them be and instead focus his efforts on brainwashing the German youth. He would start by establishing the Pioneer Organisation Ernst Thalmann and the Freie Deutsche Jugend. Both of these organizations were tasked with indoctrinating, I mean educating the youth with 
of the principles of German national syndicalism. However, the organizations tended to emphasize the German part of the principles, so instead of turning the youth into syndicalist ideologues, they accidentally ended up turning the youth into German nationalists. However, Goebbels either didn't notice or didn't care that the youth were becoming more nationalist instead of syndicalist, so he decided it was time to fix the military. While the military had a lot of recruits and a lot of equipment, after the civil war there was a noticeable lack of leadership. This was obviously a huge problem because the German army was massive and it kept growing even larger. Now, Goebbels wasn't dumb. He knew that getting new syndicalist officers for the military would take way too long, so he gave full control of the military to the former imperial officers left in Germany. Now, while many might say that giving control of your military to your former enemies is idiotic and would result in a coup, Goebbels didn't really care. His military needed an experienced high command if it was going to liberate Europe, and surprisingly, none of the imperial generals that now made up the National Volksarmee's high command wanted to coup Goebbels. Like the majority of the German government, high command saw Goebbels as an incompetent idiot that had no real control over his own government, so overthrowing him would be completely worthless and would just create unnecessary instability. After Germany's military and its industry were built up to an acceptable level, Goebbels decided that it was time to spread the revolution across Europe, so he declared war on Austria. Austria was the last monarchist country in Europe, unless you count Denmark as a country. So obviously, they were ripe for liberation, and liberated they were when over one and a half million German soldiers stormed the border, completely overwhelming the Austrian army. After the Austrian invasion, Goebbels started going a bit crazy and invaded every country that bordered Germany until only two were left. France and Russia. German High Command really wanted to invade Russia because they believed that if they didn't invade it now while its industry was still weak, then Russia would invade them in the future. But when High Command asked Goebbels to authorize an invasion of Russia, he laughed in their faces. According to Goebbels, invading Russia would be completely worthless because it would, quote, destroy Germany with the Russians' impure Slavic barbarism. So instead of invading Russia, Goebbels ordered an invasion of France. Thanks to Heinz Guderian's Panzer Corps, the invasion of France was a fairly quick affair. So with Western Europe under his thumb, Goebbels decided that his ambition was now realized, and so a new era of peace would befall Europe. After his liberation of Western Europe was done, Goebbels decided that he didn't really want to rule Germany anymore, but he didn't want to give up his position as supreme ruler of Germany, so in his eternal wisdom, Goebbels just let the German government run itself while he fucked off and went fishing or some shit. Surprisingly, nothing really changed with Goebbels' absence except for the fact that Germany started slowly becoming more democratic. While the government never held an election while Goebbels was alive, they did set up the Bundestag, a federal parliament where the people could vote for a state representative that would run Germany alongside the other state's representatives. This federal system worked shockingly well for Germany. So after Goebbels' death in 1977, the Germans decided that instead of adopting a republican system, they'd simply stick with the parliamentary system. And they also decided that they didn't really need a head of state since they'd been doing fine without one since Goebbels went on vacation in 1946. In the modern day, Germany is a very strange country. While its official name is the German Syndicalist Empire, Germany isn't an empire. It's a federal republic. And while there is certainly a syndicalist flair in Germany, what with organizations like the FDJ, the Pioneers, and the Army, which is still officially named the People's Army, the overwhelming majority of the German population considers that their nation is a democracy and that syndicalism is a system doomed to fail. The strange case of Germany shows us that a nation's future isn't decided by its leaders or by its ideology, it's decided by its people. But more importantly, it shows us that Goebbels' racist beliefs were surprisingly able to stop what would have undoubtedly been a very long, bloody, and brutal war in Russia. You see kids, maybe racism isn't that bad after all. Alright, if you enjoyed the video, feel free to leave a like, comment, and subscribe, and consider supporting me on Patreon like these people up on screen so I can keep making videos like this one. Remember to always drink and drive, and I will see you all on the next one. Roll the Haruher.